all right, this is going to be up. This is not going to be, I mean, man, we've gone through some hard stuff over these days, and I know that. It's because we live in a hard place, and we're all going through a hard time, and they don't like us. And we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with that sort of thing. And so uh, we've talked about the reality of a crazy and sinful world. And I've suggested that if you are surprised by that, you're crazier than they are. The Bible is clear in what it says about expecting these kinds of things. If the world hated you, they'll hated me, they're going to hate you too. If they persecute you, they'll persecute. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you too. We know the teaching in Romans on a fallen world. We know about Adam and Eve. That never seemed fair to me, but it is what it is. And we live in a fallen, dark world. And sometimes we forget that. And then uh, we uh, spent a good deal of time talking about managed craziness, which is God who is sovereign of everything, the bad and the good, the tears and the laughter. And then we talked about some things that we should do as Christians. And if you don't understand that God's not mad at you and that you're totally forgiven and you don't have to add anything to it and probably can't, if you don't get that, Don't try to fix the crazy world because you're crazier than they are. You're saved, but just barely. (laughs) But if you want to make a difference in the world, don't care about making a difference. Go and be involved with people who will smell the aroma of Jesus. I love the person who brought that up in the testimony time. And then today... I'm going to spend, I'm not going to spend a long time because we're all got long drives and trips ahead of us, but we're going to, we're going to talk about the future and you want to listen carefully because after all of these years, I'm going to clear up the pre-trib, post-trib situation. (laughs) I'm going to expound and uh, exegete the rapture question and I'm going to give you a date. So you could. (laughs) And if you believe any of that, you're crazy. (laughs) Now, before we get down and talk about that, I want to, I want to say something that is really important. And by the way, uh, God, when he speaks to you, generally not only speaks to you, but confirms it. And so it's not just a one time God spoke to me a thing, but in the next few days, he'll confirm it in another way with you. And this morning that happened to me. I'm using Philippians uh, 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when my brother stood up and read that text, confirmation. Um, That was the text I was thinking about. That was the text I was thinking about teaching. And when he stood up and read it, that was God. And that was really, really cool but you got to be careful. You know, uh, if you repent of booze, that's a good thing. If you've been lying, repent. If there's sexual sin in your life, repent. If you're stealing, repent. If you want to kill your brother, repent. Do you know the difference between a friend and a real friend? A friend will forgive you if you kill somebody. A real friend will help you bury the body. (laughs) (laughs) Repent of all that, but let me tell you what you you need to repent of. You gotta repent of cliches. So much of our faith is built on a cliche, and you see it all. We use verses of the Bible 
as a cliche. And as a result, we keep God at arm's length. And so I don't want you to deal with a crazy world with cliches. Romans 8, 28 is certainly true. All things do work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But don't make that into a cliche so that you miss the darkness and the hardness and the difficulty of living in a fallen world. It's hard. And there is no sweet, easy mix. There's no Christian kumbaya and campfire we can sit around. It's hard. And we've been told it's hard, so don't cover it with cliches. A number of years ago, I was uh, doing a Let's Get Religious week at a university, Christian university. And uh, two weeks prior to that, a very close friend of mine had died. And, I, uh, and at the end of the first session, a young lady came forward and said, Dr. Brown, I think you knew my father. And uh, I said, who's your father? She told me his name. I said, yes, I knew him. And I loved him. And I'm so sorry. You must be going through a hard time. She said, oh, no. We've seen so many people come to Christ at his funeral. And we've been rejoicing. And I remember saying to her, young lady, that's bull. Your daddy just died. That's not good. And she fell apart in my arms and just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And throughout that entire week when I wasn't speaking or teaching, I was walking with her around the campus, letting her face the reality and the darkness of the curse of death. And not only that, her dad had written her a note once a week, and now she couldn't get the notes anymore. So for a year, every week, I wrote her a note to remind her of her dad and to remind her of her real father who's in heaven. So don't cover it. Don't do that. Uh, cliches are not a good thing. But hope is a good thing. And the scriptures are clear without changing the darkness to say, hang tough. This is the principle. You can stand hell if you know you're going to get out. You can stand hell if you know you're going to get out. You've probably heard the illustration. A lot of people have used it. If we were a group of people and I was a scientist and worked for the government and we had decided to send you on a space trip, I would say to one group, half of you, you are in for the most exciting, wonderful experience of your entire life. It's going to blow you away. You're going to see planets. You're going to see stars in ways you've never seen before. But there is a problem. We have no idea how to bring you back. <laughs> but man, you're going to go out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> and then to the other group, I would say, you're going you're gonna to love this space trip. You're going to see stars that you've never seen before up close. And we're sending you to a planet that is even more beautiful than Earth. And you're going to be the forefathers and the foremothers of a whole new generation. And it is going to be a wonderful experience throughout your life and your children's life and your grandchildren's life. So rejoice. In those two groups, which group is going to write great music? Which group is going to party? Which group is going to write books and care for one another? Which group is going to dance and sing and laugh? Well, we're that group that dances, that sings and laughs, 
because, because of the future. But that's true, not just individually. There's heaven. The good news is you're going to heaven, and the bad news is you're going on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> but not just because of heaven. That story and that illustration works when you talk about a culture and a nation and the direction that things are going in. I want you to know we, we live in the saddest time I've ever seen. I've never seen so much downness, so much nihilism, so much depression, so much suicide. It is crazy. We get thousands of letters at Key Life. And I can't sit there and read many of them very long without either crying or cussing or telling God you're doing this wrong. It's, it's, we live in a very, very sad time. But cheer up. He's coming. Cheer up. The truth always comes out. If you're familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd rather talk to a bunch of drunks than anybody that I know. My dad was an alcoholic, and I, uh, and I love people that struggle with booze. Um, we had a doctor in our church when I was a pastor who ran the first resident AA program in the country. And every time she had a graduation, she would invite me to come and speak for the graduation, and I loved it. I didn't have to tell jokes. I didn't have to get them on my side. All I had to do was tell them about Jesus, and they were open, and they were gone. And she said to me a lot of times, and you hear this around AA a lot, that, that you got to be at the end, the end of yourself before anything good takes place. <laughs> I was speaking for a conference in, on the coast of New Jersey of executives from New York. And it was a pretty uptight conference center that they had rented for this executive thing. And a guy with a buzz cut stood up before all of these executives and said, have you noticed that there's a no smoking sign on every tree? If we find you smoking, we'll send you home. Now, these are executives, and they're looking at each other like, we've stepped into a Kafka novel. Something is weird about this place. But I was the speaker, and as you know, I smoke a pipe. And I thought, surely they wouldn't send the speaker home. <laughs> and one time they were having this, uh, this meeting, and I thought, you know, I can sneak. There's a forest around here, and there's, a, there's this leg, uh, a lake, and you can take a canoe, and it, it, has a, it cuts to the left down at the end, and you're out. They can't see you from the conference center. And I'd gone for two days. I was very close to being a serial killer. <laughs> and so I thought, I'm going down there and I'm going to smoke. Now, right next to this, this is true, <clears throat> right next to the conference center, they had a rehabilitation center for former drunks. And I'm doing this canoe. <laughs> and I look up on a bench in the other place and a guy's sitting there smoking a cigar. And so I get my robe and go. I, I said, uh, I thought they didn't let people smoke around here. He said, they don't unless you're a drunk. <laughs> I swear that's what he said. And it was the first time in my life I wanted to be an alcoholic. <laughs> Got to come, got to come to the end of yourself, and things begin to change. And that's true of a culture too. And we're fast getting to that place. And I believe, and I bet you've seen it in your years serving elected office. 
when a culture or a town or a community or a city gets in serious trouble, they make excuses, they blame everybody else, but there's still the death. And eventually, the truth comes out. So wait and watch and be still. It works that way. And that's the first thing that I would say to you. What God begins, he always completes. And the fact of the beginning is the absolute and sure promise it will be completed. That's Philippians again, 1.6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what? Watch and wait and it will be completed in your life and in our nation and in our world when he returns. And by the way, uh, let me say just as an aside by way of encouragement, quit trying so hard to be good. I wrote a book once called Three Free Sins. I w wish I could do it again, I would change the title. I've gotten more criticism and more anger about that book. And I did, they didn't read it. If they had read it, they would have seen that it was biblical. But the whole central theme of that book was this. The reason Christians are so bad is because they're trying so hard to be good. That would be me. I mean, I have really tried hard. You're not ordained. I mean, you haven't served. I've told Jesus a lot of times, I wouldn't do this for anybody but you. <laughs> but I'm still here, and I'm still doing it. And, and uh, I mean, I've been working at this really hard. And you know something? In some ways, I'm worse than I was before. <laughs> Is that crazy? I thought I'd be fixed by now. I looked at my heroes and met some of them and found out they were worse than I was. It's really, but let me tell you something. I'm better. I'm kinder. I'm more merciful. I'm more loving. I'm more obedient, so there. And I didn't do a thing. I, I really didn't. Uh, it just... It just sort of happened. So chill out. Quit working so hard about it. And see what God does in your life. And I promise, on the authority of God's word, you are going to get better. And you can't help it. And you'll kick against the goads. And if you're like me, you will say, I don't want to be better but you can't stop it because when God begins something, he completes it. And the beginning of it is the absolute promise of its completeness. And that's true of us as individuals and it's also true of a country like America. It's always true of your city and your community where you love and even your church. What God starts, he completes. And the fact of it starting is an absolute promise of his finishing it. So rejoice. We're I think that we're going to see some stuff that is going to blow our minds. We're almost there. And I believe before Jesus comes back, our nation is going to reach the bottom with no place to turn except to him. And at that moment, God's spirit will be poured out on a dry and thirsty land and we'll see people running to Jesus because they don't have any other place to go. 
And if they don't, and that doesn't happen, he'll come to us. I, uh, I don't have strong feelings about eschatology or the eschatological doctrines of the Bible. If I were forced, I would say I probably am not big on the rapture. I think that Revelation teaches that tribulation is a part of what Christians face all the time. Corey Ten Boom, and I had lunch with her just shortly before she died. Corey Ten Boom said she saw more tribulation in the world today than anything described in the book of Revelation. So I don't know about the great tribulation or what a thousand years means. I don't know about the millennium, the pre or post, or if the rapture happens when it's going to. I don't know any of that, but I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that Jesus is coming back and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I have a friend, uh, he's my age, and we meet at Christmas every year just to make sure we're both alive. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, he was telling me about a black friend of his. My friend is a Baptist pastor, and he was telling me about a, another guy that he loves, probably his best friend, who's African-American. He said he had been meeting with him the week before. And uh, Ken said, I asked him, I said, you know, we're getting pretty close to cramming for finals. What are you looking forward to in heaven? And he said, this black pastor said, you know, Ken, what I'm looking forward to. Uh, and Ken sounded like this when he was telling me, uh, it, sounding like his friend, Ken, I tell you what I'm looking forward to going to get to heaven and I'm looking to forward to Jesus grabbing the church by the collar and holding the church up and shaking it in the face of Satan, old Slewfoot. And Jesus is going to say, that's all I had. That's all I had and I still kicked your butt. <laughs> we know that. That's why we laugh. You can stand hell if you know you're going to get out. And one way or the other, we're going to get out. Wouldn't it be cool? Who was it that said, Flea, was it you that if Jesus came back right now, you wouldn't have to make that drive. I, I want him to wait till I get a smoke. <laughs> you know, and I'm about finished. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, and I want you, uh, before you leave this place, in the fresh air and the beauty of what God has given his people. Just say to him before you drive away, okay, I'm available. I won't duck. I'll do it. But you got to help. You want to hear a good story to end by? Uh, there was this police officer in this small community. And they were having a serious problem with DUIs. Uh, I mean, there were drunk drivers and they, weren't, and they chased it down and found it was coming from a particular bar in this particular community. And so the police officer said he was going to make a blow for law and order. So one night late, he pulled his police car into the parking lot of this particular bar, and he just waited as people came out. And then one guy came out, and he was staggering. And the officer said, that's my man. That's my man. And he staggered. I couldn't find his, parking, his car. 
And when he found his car, it, he tried to, he couldn't find his key. When he finally found his key, his hand was shaking so bad, he couldn't get it in the hole, and he finally got it in. And when he got in the car, he turned the lines, the lights off and on and off and on and off and then on. And the officers watching all of this and say, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And then the man very slowly pulled out of the parking lot of the bar, started down the road, and the officer turned his blue light on and pulled him over. And he said, sir, please exit your car. And he did. And he gave him a breathalyzer test, and it showed that he was cold stone sober. <laughs> and the officer shook it looked at it and gave it to him again, and it showed exactly the same thing. He said, Mr. Sir, walk this line, walk a straight line. The man walked it perfectly, came back, and he said, something's wrong. And he said, no, there's nothing wrong. I'm not drunk. I'm the designated decoy. <laughs> It probably doesn't fit, but <laughs> I'm a preacher and I'm gonna make it fit. That's what we are. We're designated decoys. And Jesus has made the designation. And folks, the people we've been talking about, they don't have anybody else. It's us. So don't you shilly-shally. You think about that. 